Welcome back again, ladies and gentlemen. Laszlo Montgomery here with another China History Podcast episode, Guangzhou Part 2 today. Last time we got all the ancient history out of the way, like a lot of this material from these earliest days, we depend mostly on official court documents and various other works, many of which we have to either believe or hold suspect. Even in today's world, it's sometimes hard to separate truth from fiction. So one or two thousand years ago requires a bit of a leap of faith as to the veracity of what we read or hear about. With respect to Guangzhou's past, to supplement a lot of the most ancient Chinese historical documents, there's also quite a bit of written accounts that have come down to us from many of the foreign merchants who engaged in the Nanhai trade, the commerce that was carried out at all the historic ports of the South China Sea. We're fortunate to have so many surviving writings from Arab, Persian, Indian, and other South Asians. That's really where a good portion of our understanding of this region comes from. A lot has been learned from archaeological discoveries, as well as from shipwrecks found at the bottom of the sea. So let's continue on here and try and take it to at least the end of the Song Dynasty. Throughout early history, and now in the Tang, It was trade that defined the city of Guangzhou. And looking back, that truly was the city's entire raison d'etre. The indigenous Baiyue tribes who long populated these lands in the south, they were sea traders. And the articles they traded in were too prized and hotly in demand. And this bounty of exotica and precious commodities is what ultimately led to the conquest of the Yue people by Qin Shi Huang's armies. His impact on the centuries that followed was much more long-lasting than his dynasty. We looked at the Nanyue kingdom that grew out of the Nanhai commandery established during the Qin. Zhao Tuo declared himself a king, then an emperor, then a king, and during the period of this rule, Lingnan culture received a nice, shot in the arm with all the northern ways and customs slowly incorporated by Zhao Tuo into the long-established culture of the Nanyue region. Han Dynasty founder Gao Zhu tried to put an end to the Nanyue kingdom, but failed, though he did manage to commence the political integration of Nanyue with the emerging Han Empire. But it will take until the time of Han Wu Di to finish off Nanyue and the other remaining holdouts in the south who up till his reign, had continued to remain independent of the expanding Chinese state in the north. And we looked at Guangzhou during the time of Sun Quan and the Three Kingdoms and saw how the city's name first came into being. During this time of the king and then emperor of Eastern Wu, Guang Prefecture was established and given the name Guangzhou in the year 226, Zhou being the word back then for a prefecture. And clear through to the Tang Dynasty that was founded in 618, it was trade, and little else, that defined this city. This was its value to the political center in the north. Guangzhou was a natural gateway to China for all the most desirable and in-demand commodities of the day that Southeast Asia had to offer the region. Sailing vessels were comparatively small back then, and the only cargo that made sense to load on board were things that were also small and had a high selling price in the China market. Going in the other direction of the fast-expanding Maritime Silk Road was Chinese porcelain. Now, you'll recall from that History of Tea podcast series, it was around the tongue, that demand for porcelain in China where it began to scale up to dizzying heights. So we begin the Tang Dynasty, 618 to 907. Plenty of Guangzhou history happened during this golden era of China history. You know, from about the time the Tang Taizong got all settled in the 620s, clear throughout Wu Zetian's reign, 690 to 705, and about up to the Tianbao era of Xuanzong, you could say the Tang Dynasty had perhaps the best 125-year run of almost any civilization in history. When we hearken back to the magnificent Tang Dynasty, it was this period when Chang'an was rightly called the greatest city in the world and Silk Road commerce was firing on all 12 cylinders. 
755 to 763 came the Anlushan Rebellion that devastated the Tang Empire to such an extent it never really bounced back. And for the Tang brand, those years from the 760s till the end came in 907 were 15 harsh decades. Though no one could deny that period yielded some great poetry. Whatever commerce that got transacted along the Silk Roads of Central Asia had almost no bearing on which way the winds blew in Guangzhou. The city lived and died on the fortunes or misfortunes of being China's southern gateway for seafaring merchants. Even as late as the Tang, Guangzhou was still a place of banishment for officials and politicians who had fallen from favor during the political struggles at the imperial court. It was a place where one got sent against their will. The weather, the distance from the center of the action in government, the unfamiliar aspects of Lingnan culture, and the lack of any semblance of traditional northern Chinese culture that any elite or aristocrat might recognize, turned Guangzhou into a place synonymous with misery and political exile. And the proliferation of foreigners residing there as well is not a small number. It gave the city an otherworldly cross-cultural appearance, very much like what you might see camped outside the palace walls in Chang'an. But those Silk Road traders, they came from Central Asia, were mostly Persian, Turkic, or Indo-European. They had been regular fixtures up in the north of China going back for centuries. Northern Chinese in the capital and other political centers of the country were used to them. But down in Guangzhou, the sight of all the indigenous people, Arabs, Indians, or Persians, despite them being Asian, from all points of the Nanhai and beyond, it was still somewhat unnerving to many from the traditional north. The first mosque in Guangzhou was built, it's been said, by none other than Said bin Abi Waqqas himself in the late 620s when Islam first came knocking on the door of China from this southerly direction. This was the Huai Sheng Mosque, or Great Mosque of Canton, with its characteristic Guangta, or pagoda, rising 36 meters high. As you could well imagine, the Islamic faithful made this mosque the center of their life whilst residing in Guangzhou. And like so much of historic Guangzhou, this mosque is located in the Yueshou district of the city, a 20-25 minute walk to the banks of the Pearl River. The number of Arabs sailing to China greatly increased after the establishment of the Abbasid Caliphate in 750. Up until that time, trade from the Near East had been dominated by Persians. The first of two serious disturbances involving the foreign traders calling on Guangzhou happened in October 758. We're not entirely sure what events led up to this sacking of the city by Arab and Persian pirates or merchant seamen. The Book of Tang and other Chinese and non-Chinese sources all mention the ferociousness of this attack against the Guangzhou inhabitants. It's been suggested that the spark that may have caused this conflagration was the outrageousness of the behavior of a number of powerful officials who sometimes demanded too big of a cut or messed with the merchant's payments. Who's to say... But one thing's for sure, so devastating was the destruction caused during the sacking of Guangzhou. Trade, as it had always been carried out, came to a halt for almost half a century. And with the port of Guangzhou out of commission like it was, merchants instead purchased their Chinese wares in Jiaozhi, or Annam, as Vietnam was called during the Tang. There's conflicting accounts about this 758 AD sacking of the city that followed the Anlushan Rebellion that had only been put down two years prior. By the dawn of the 9th century, normalcy began to return to Guangzhou. Up in Yangzhou, Jiangsu province, another of the wealthy trading centers, a stop on the Grand Canal, around the same time as the sacking of Guangzhou in 760, Arab Persian, and other foreign merchants were brutally attacked there. No number on how many perished in the attack, though it was written to have been in the thousands. The old Book of Tang recorded that the slaughter there was led by an official and general named Tian Shanggong. After all the horrors of the Anlushan Rebellion, 
An Lushan, himself being a foreigner, part Sogdian, part Gurk Turk, and many of his followers too, not being Han Chinese, well, this stoked a lot of post rebellion anti foreign emotions. Foreigners in China got to experience that helpless feeling of being scapegoated for the people's suffering. I know it's the enmity and bloodshed between East and West that usually sucks all the oxygen out of the room as far as popular history goes, but the truth is that most of the time, trade was very, very lucrative for both buyers and sellers, and despite these incidents, for the most part, things were business as usual. By the way, in 1975, a shipyard was discovered in Panyu dating back to the time of the Qin, or at least to the Han. So Chinese maritime history, it goes back much, much farther than the Tang. The second time Guangzhou experienced massive unrest came in 879 during the autumn of that year. This incident is known as the Guangzhou Massacre. And with a name like that inscribed into the history books, it's worth taking notice of. The story behind this incident involved the rebel leader Huang Chao and the peasant uprising he partly led that broke out in the 870s, at a time when the Tang Dynasty was already past its sell-by date. Many scholars believe this destructive and murderous Huang Chao rebellion was really the final nail in the coffin for the Li family's fortunes and their Tang Dynasty. Circumstances affecting the rebellion, led by Wang Xianzhi and Huang Chao, forced Huang soldiers to march southward, below the Yangtze, and as they made their way in the direction of the Lingnan region, they left a rather predictable path of destruction. And when they got to Guangzhou, and after the governor refused to open the city gates for Huang Chao's rebel army, they forced their way in, and once again, the city was sacked. And all the foreign residents at this stage, mostly Arabs, Persians, Jews, and Christians, were all put to the sword. The Huang Chao rebel leaders had no love for the foreigners, no matter those from north of the Great Wall or down in the south. No surprise, there are conflicting reports about what actually transpired. Estimates of casualties range from tens of thousands up to 120 to 200,000 killed. Either way, by anyone's reckoning, this incident met the basic definition of a massacre. And foreigners weren't the only ones to come face to face with the violence and the attacks by the Huangchao rebels. Plenty of local Chinese residing in Guangzhou, they too were also caught up in this terrible event of 879. I also read that just as Scipio Africanus Minor in 146 BC allegedly plowed the agricultural fields of Carthage with salt, well, the Huangchao rebels purposely destroyed all the mulberry forests in the Guangzhou area. And this put a serious crimp in the supply chain affecting the silk industry, mulberry leaves being one of the key components. Silk was also one of the main commodities of the Maritime Silk Road. One thing I wanted to mention... Unlike the trade later on with the European nations, who often had little or nothing to offer in products that were hotly in demand in China, these early traders of the Maritime Silk Road brought all kinds of commodities to China that were heavily in demand, and therefore traded with the Chinese as equals. A thousand years later, this won't be the case, which will lead to actions that haunt us still in the 21st century. So with the city of Guangzhou in ruins, Guangdong's loss was Fujian's gain. And here is where the trading volume began to shift more to the city of Quanzhou. The three main ports of trade in China up to this point were Guangzhou, Quanzhou, and Yangzhou, known by the Arabs as Kanfu, Kanchu, and Kantu, respectively. There was also the port in Annam near Hanoi that was called Luqin. Quanzhou's role as a major trading port and market will grow exponentially during the Song and Yuan dynasties. So, 758, it was the Arabs and Persians in Guangzhou rising up against the city and engaging in the mass murder of the inhabitants. Now, in 879, revenge was sweet against these many foreigners who the Huangchao rebels had scapegoated for so much of the misfortune in the Lingnan region. 
trade at the port of Guangzhou didn't exactly get extinguished, it still continued. But as I said, commercial vessels opted to call on the port of Quanzhou in the southern part of Fujian province, where the Hokkien people originated from. It's going to take until about the Song Dynasty before Guangzhou makes its comeback. So following the fall of the Tang, China itself experienced a long period of disunity and internal strife. And it will take until the Northern Zhou Dynasty almost to put everything back together in the mid-10th century before one of their own, Zhao Kuangyin, established the Song in 960. When the Tang Dynasty ended in 907, it ushered in both the 72-year Five Dynasties and Ten Kingdoms period, as well as the establishment of the Kitan Liao Dynasty in the north. And these invaders from Manchuria they got to play a central role, for a while at least, in blocking China's rise. Okay, we're back. Well, how did the great city of Guangzhou fare during this Wu Dai Shi Guo, Five Dynasties, Ten Kingdoms time that was in between the Tang and the Song? Well, the city's history was inexorably tied to one of these ten kingdoms, called the Southern Han Dynasty. The history of the Southern Han began with two brothers, Liu Yin and Liu Yan, whose father had served the Tang military in southern China, based in Zhao Qing. Liu Yin, he was the real achiever among the two brothers and rose high in the Tang government in Guangdong, but he died early in 911, right after the fall of the dynasty. And during his time, when he had nominal control over the Lingnan region, Liu Yin at first agreed to become a vassal of the later Liang dynasty that was founded by former Huangchao rebel and army leader Zhu Wen after he executed the last Tang emperor. We know him as Emperor Taizu of later Liang. But with the death of Liu Yin, brother Liu Yan stepped up and took over the leadership. He broke ranks and went his own way following the death of the later Liang Emperor Taizu. With such a force of nature as this emperor out of the way, Liu Yan went on to establish the Yue Dynasty in what was basically the Lingnan region, including Hainan. The capital was based in historic Panyu. Liu Yan went and changed the name of the city to Xingwang Fu a year later in 918. Early on, Liu Yan, or Emperor Gaozu, he decided to change the dynasty name from Yue to Han. After all, his family surname was Liu, same as the great Han dynasty emperors of yore, Liu Bang, Liu Heng, Liu Qi, Liu Che, and Liu Xiu. He figured his dynasty, too, was equally worthy of that great Han name. And because of its geographic location, it was referred to by historians as the Southern Han. And Liu Yan, well, he had some big plans, including expanding his kingdom's territories into the southwest, into northern Vietnam, where the people there were enjoying a respite following the fall of the Tang. Liu Yan, Southern Han Emperor Gaozu, Ah, he was jonesing to take over those lands of the former protectorate general to pacify the south, the Annan Duhufu. Essentially, he was looking to recreate the borders of the Nanyue kingdom that Zhao Tuo had established following the fall of the Qin. Instead, this rather obscure dynasty from the Five Dynasties and Ten Kingdoms period, the Southern Han, well, they ended up being the one in the year 938, who lost the territories in Vietnam that had since been renamed the Jinghai Circuit. Do you remember? There were four so-called periods of Chinese domination in Vietnam. To repeat, the first time occurred during the Western Han, beginning with the demise of the Nanyue Kingdom in 111 BC. This first period of domination famously came to an end with the fabled story of the Trung Sisters. Then for a second time, from 43 to 544, the Vietnamese people found themselves under the thumb of China during the Northern and Southern Dynasties period. And then for a third time, the Vietnamese people, following the Sui former Li War, found themselves living under China's thumb. But as I said, after the Tang Dynasty fell on hard times in the 860s, Vietnamese warlords had been able to seize back control of their lands. 
And now the Southern Han army intended to go in and vanquish these Vietnamese forces and restore the lands in the north of Vietnam that had been absorbed into China three times already. And this famously culminated in the Battle of the Bac Dang River, led by one of Vietnam's great heroes and dynasty founders, Ngo Quyen, who decisively defeated the Southern Han military, ending the third period of Chinese rule over Vietnam. Then three and a half centuries later, the Mongol Yuan military will fall for the same trick in 1288 that the Southern Han military fell for in 938, having their heads handed to them at the Second Battle of the Bac Dang River. Let me also mention about Southern Han Emperor Gaozu. I checked through a bunch of lists of the worst, in terms of cruelest, Chinese emperors, and surprisingly, Southern Han Emperor Gaozu did not make any top ten lists. But that didn't mean he wasn't a harsh, twisted, and depraved ruler operating from his palace in Xingwangfu in present-day Guangzhou. Over in the city's Yuexiao district on Jiaoyu Road at Xihu Road, you have the Yaozhou Ruins, the Yaozhou Yichu, right there in the center of modern-day Guangzhou. Emperor Gaozu of Southern Han, Liu Yan, he sought to recreate the splendor of Chang'an down in his Guangzhou capital. And he built this pleasure garden using the existing ponds and marshland in the city to construct this lake about five football pitches long called Fairy Lake. And for a long time, until it all got filled in and fell to ruin, it was a place where one could commune with nature in the center of the capital. Yao means medicine. And it said this name, the Yaozhou Ruins, came from all the alchemists who congregated there to experiment in the production of medicines and elixirs. The site is also called Jiu Yao Yuan for the nine weirdly shaped stones in the center of the lake. Over at Guangxiao Temple, mentioned last episode, one of the oldest Buddhist temples, there are two iron pagodas called the East and West Towers. And these relics, too, were also built there during the Southern Han. Once again, let me mention the tens of millions of people living and working in and around the city of Guangzhou today. Below their footsteps in the buildings and attractions, there's more than 2,000 years of history buried deep. Some of it accessible that you can see today, like this site. But most of ancient Guangzhou is still buried beneath the city, waiting to be discovered. Anyway, by all accounts written about him, this founding Southern Han emperor had a thing about torture, brutality, and ultraviolence. Not necessarily in that order. And like a certain modern-day ruler, I won't say his name, but he was a big proponent of using poison to rid himself of suspected enemies, which included the indigenous Yue population who were all still very much around, you know, this late in the game during the Southern Han. The final emperor of Southern Han to occupy the palace in Guangzhou, Liu Chang, now he became ruler at the age of 16. And if you read the official histories and other historical accounts, basically spent all his time having sexual orgies and hanging out with the bevy of beauties he kept in the palace harem. So with all that inattention he gave to important matters, he ran the dynasty right into the ground, which was basically where things were already heading by the time he became emperor in 958. It took Zhao Kuangyin's Song armies until 971 to capture Guangzhou and bring an end to the southern Han dynasty. During the Song and much later in the Ming, No one was terribly complimentary in the official histories about the Southern Han and their barbaric and sadistic rulers and the stories of the extravagance of Gaozu's court that rivaled a few of the previous profligate emperors. Despite the infamy heaped on the Southern Han dynasty by scholars and historians who followed, the time was also remembered in a positive light, particularly by scholars writing in the 19th century, for some of the culture that grew from this period, primarily in literature. So it wasn't all bad. By a landslide, during the Tang, and again in the Song, the most important trade carried out at Guangzhou was between China and the Muslim world. Trade that originated in the Persian Gulf. 
Islam came to China not only via the Silk Roads that passed through Xinjiang, Gansu, Ningxia, and Shanxi, it also arrived, more importantly perhaps, via the Maritime Silk Road in general, and the city of Guangzhou in particular. During the Song, woodblock printing really had a great leap forward, which led to more private historical accounts of Chinese history, including what was happening in Guangzhou. And thanks to the outcome of the Battle of Talas in 751 in modern-day Kazakhstan, or Kyrgyzstan, not 100% sure, the Arabs acquired the secrets of papermaking, if you believe the legend. And this led to the establishment decades later of the first paper mill in Baghdad that allowed the paper manufacturing process to be scaled up to the extent that it led to a golden age of Arabic literature. And this was at the outset of the Abbasid dynasty, or caliphate, 758 to 1258. And as far as Islamic visitors to Guangzhou, both traders and travelers, they had plenty to write about their experiences. So we have quite a decent historical record from Muslim sources who wrote about their travels to China during this period. From the port of Basra to Guangzhou, with favorable winds, could be accomplished in three months' time. I'd have to say it was during the southern Song Dynasty, 1127 to 1279, that Guangzhou became more important to the imperial center of China than any other time before in its history. After the Song state, lost control of the Silk Road trade following Hui Zong's time in the late 1120s, maritime trade became all the more important. Between the loss of revenue from Silk Road trade as well as the losses incurred from the crushing tribute payments to China's northern conquerors, namely the Jin Dynasty in the north and the Xixia in the northwest, more than ever, the southern Song depended on maritime trade along its coasts to rescue the nation's finances. The Song court in modern-day Hangzhou looked to maritime trade in the south, in Guangzhou and Quanzhou, as a lifeline to generate desperately needed revenue for the imperial coffers. Never had the city of Guangzhou been of such critical importance to the imperial court than during the Song dynasty. Maritime trade was vigorously carried out in Guangzhou, Quanzhou, Yangzhou, as well as in Zhejiang province at Ningbo and other ports. It was during the Song that Quanzhou replaced Guangzhou as the busiest port in the south of China. Ceramics had by far become the most important commodity of maritime trade. Tea and silk were still light enough whereby pack animals and human beings could carry the goods from China to the closest trading centers in the West. But ceramics, oh, that was both heavy and fragile, and not suited to land transport over long distances through the rugged terrains of Central Asia. Ceramics was a commodity that had to go by sea. And as it would years later in the Qing, Chinese ceramic ware was a major commodity traded with the merchants supplying the splendid residences and palaces in the Muslim world. Guangzhou didn't just thrive on maritime trade. China domestic north-south trade was also greatly enhanced beginning in the late Tang by the reconstruction of the Meiguan Road that was originally built during Qin Shi Huang's time as a means to facilitate the transport of luxury goods from the south to the north. This pass, also known as Dayuling, was located near the border of Guangdong and Jiangxi. So Guangzhou prospered in two directions— by sea and through the China domestic trade with the provinces north of Guangdong. The Fanfang, or foreign ghetto of Guangzhou, mentioned last time, was located, not surprisingly, near the Huaisheng Mosque in the Guangta district, a part of the city named after the Guangtas, or pagodas, or minarets of the Huaisheng Mosque. As far as how trade was carried out between the Muslim traders and the Chinese, one Arab account went like this, quote, When the sailors arrived in Guangzhou from the sea, the Chinese officials held their goods, stored them in warehouses, and guaranteed responsibility up to six months until the last merchant has arrived. Then they take a third of each commodity and give the rest to the merchant. The ruler takes what they need on the basis of maximum price, pays it quickly, and does not treat the visitors unjustly. End quote. As far as duties and tribute and what the Chinese authorities took from the foreign traders, 
That rose and fell depending on the fortunes of the dynasty's finances. When they needed more, they extracted a higher price from the foreign merchants and duties. Not long after the Song army had vanquished the southern Han in 977, a trade office was established in Guangzhou to better regulate trade and rake in the revenues. And these Muslims who came to southern China during the Tang and Song They made themselves useful and valuable to the state through the introduction of Arab and Persian discoveries in astronomy, mathematics, medicine, and other sciences. You could say this was no different from what the Jesuits brought to China later on during the Ming and Qing. And the Fanfang, this foreign enclave in Guangzhou, was not only a place for merchants to cool their heels during the trading season— It also contained a sizable population of foreigners who resided there full-time in Guangzhou and who had studied the language, the culture, and adapted their lives to the Chinese ways. And though they lived separately from the local population, they were also an integral part of the city. After Kublai Khan established the Yuan Dynasty in 1271, the Mongols had invaded the north of China first, conquering the Kitan Liao, the Jurchen Jin, and the Tangut Western Xia dynasties. And they kept moving southward in their takeover of the Chinese mainland. It took the next several years for the Mongol conquest of southern China to be completed. The final dramatic showdown for the Song dynasty happened eh, not too far from Guangzhou, just on the other side of the Pearl River Delta, near Taishan, at the Battle of Mount Yashan, also called the Battle of Yaman, March 19th, 1279. Five years into the conquest of the south of China by the Mongols came this sad and tragic ending of Zhao Kuangyin's Song Dynasty. The tale of the final gasp of breath for the dynasty has been told and retold who knows how many times. This is the famous story from Chinese history concerning the Loyal Song officials led by Lu Xiaofu and Admiral Zhang Shijie and their attempts, in vain, to preserve the Zhao royal house of the Song dynasty. After the Mongols took Fujian province, Zhang Shijie and Lu Xiaofu bundled up the little boy emperor Zhao Bing and took to the seas in the direction of Guangdong. They made a brief stop in Hong Kong on Lantau Island. Zhao Bing had been crowned emperor, all of seven years old. Then following that final military defeat at Yashan, this last emperor of the Song dynasty didn't get to enjoy being the son of heaven for long. When the end came and his party was cornered, Lu Xiaofu picked up the young boy emperor in his arms and took that fateful leap from the mountain cliff and crashed into the seas below. With the Mongol takeover of all of China, there was another massive migration of northern Chinese who came to the south. This brought the population of the city of Guangzhou to numbers never seen before. And with so much Han migration to the south part of China following the fall of the southern Song, the place began to fill up more, and the ratio of Han Chinese to foreigners and other indigenous peoples slanted strongly in the favor of the former. And with the arrival of such a vast number of Chinese from the north, this is where Guangdong province develops into one of the cultural, artistic, and literary centers of the country. It was no longer solely a city of trade and commerce, with such a great influx of people from the north. The economy and cultural development of Guangdong reached its greatest heights ever, In fact, Guangdong province's role as the main engine that powered the nation's economy, becoming the richest province in China, it all began during the Mongol Yuan dynasty and would be taken to even greater heights during the Ming and Qing dynasties. And that's what we're going to look at next time in part three. Class dismissed. Once again, go to the website to download a copy of the free PDF that offers you all the pinyin Chinese characters and English for all the terms used in this episode. This History of Guangzhou Part 2 has a longer than usual list of terms. Just go to teacup.media and download the official episode listing of terms. No need to fill out any forms or anything. And while you're there, feel free to click on the support button and browse through all the 
various ways you can help support my efforts, maybe show some appreciation. A few bucks, well, that'll get me a senior meal at one of the plethora of local fast food joints near my crib. Man, you could hardly get through a podcast these days without someone trying to get something out of you. I thank you for your kind consideration. Okay, all beautiful people around the world, my deepest heartfelt thanks for listening. This is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from Los Angeles, California, IA. More Guangzhou history next time, you could rest assured. So do uh, mull over the idea of coming back next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.